Okay, so now we're going to learn about passwords and whether you ever need to remember another password. Uh, ben DeCry from Auth0 is going to describe uh, web authentication and how it can work and uh, why, why it's so much better than passwords. Thanks very much, Ben. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Let me just see if I can share my screen. There we go. So no pressure on this talk then. I've got a lot to deliver uh, according to John's intro. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, I'd like to talk today about uh, WebAuthn, which is a new standard of authentication uh, for the web. Uh, a bit about me first before we get started, uh, get my clicker to work. Uh, my name is Ben, as you've heard, I'm a software engineer. I've been a software engineer now for over 20 years. I actually started back on like PHP backend applications and now I'm doing front end and, and all over the place. APIs, uh, obviously one of the biggest things uh, in the last few years in terms of things moving to um, applications in, in the browser and mobile apps connecting. Um, very important part of our developer ecosystem now. Uh, a lot of the focus that I've had in those 10 years, whether it's been front end, back end, API, whatever, has always been around security and privacy, which basically culminated in me starting to work as a developer advocate for Auth0. Uh, and coming to up to almost three years uh, doing that. One of the things that really excites me about WebAuth, and, and we'll, we'll do a bit of a dive into the flows today, is that it kind of gives control back to your users again. Uh, up until now, credentials have mostly been in the realm of stuff that we store on our servers somehow, uh, whereas WebAuth and, and the hardware authenticators that we'll look at, they give, uh, they, they put all of that back into your users' hands. Uh, so we're increasing security yet again by removing things from uh, the things that we need to store. Uh, and also there's a couple of extra features of WebAuthn that are, are really quite interesting uh, for web-based authentication. Let's just get straight into it. So let's have a think about three main things that we look at, main considerations we have when we judge a credential as, a, a credentials as an option on its uh, performance. So the three things that I consider when I'm looking at any set of credentials is, is it easy to remember? Uh, and also, is it hard to guess? Is it something that's easy to change? If uh, if it's easy for me to remember how to log in, but I uh, the, the details get compromised somehow, how quickly can I change my credentials so that nobody else can use whatever they've just gotten from me? Uh, and part of that as well is how easy is it to intercept. If I can change my, my credentials easily and they're really easy to use, my user experience is great. Uh, but if somebody else can also intercept that fairly easily, then obviously I'm, I'm less secure. Let's have a look at these three now and, and how they apply to some of the credentials we're already familiar with. The, um, the measure that I'm going to use is highly scientific. I'm basically going to tell you whether or not it's good, bad, or somewhere in between. That's about as close as I'm going to get to a scientific measurement today. So how does the performance of, let's start with passwords. Uh, how does the performance of passwords look? Passwords, as we all know, are hard. They're hard to remember. Uh, they're, they're easy to guess insofar as they're innumerable. You can do um, uh, like brute force attacks. Uh, and in terms of remembering, the reason why so many people reuse their passwords is because they are hard to remember. It's easy to remember one, two, maybe five passwords. As soon as you get beyond that, you're starting to look at things like password managers. And that that comes, again, into the, the hard to remember aspect, because if you then use a different device, then you've got to have access to your password manager and all of these things. So generally, in terms of usability and ease of use, uh, passwords are, are in the hard basket. That said, they are probably one of the easiest ones to change because a password is just stored in a database somewhere. So if I wanted to change my password, presumably there's going to be some kind of hashing to secure my password while it's, it's stored in the database. But essentially, it's just a database update uh, or similar kind of operation. Uh, hard to intercept? That's I'm putting that one in the gray, gray area, right in the middle. Uh, with HTTPS everywhere, hopefully, nowadays, uh, we're, we're making sure that passwords are a lot more secure in transit. However, we still have issues with um, passwords at, at rest. So if somebody uh, internally intentionally leaks the database, or if there's a, uh, a breach in your, your infrastructure and somebody manages to get the, the, the username and passwords out, if they're not stored correctly, uh, if there's a, a phishing attempt or a man-in-the-middle attack, all of these things can add into uh, making the interception a, a, a possible possibility when it comes to passwords. So not impossible, but not completely out, ruled out either. 
Uh, let's have a look at it. Oh, and also, yes, of course, uh, have I been pwned is exactly one of these databases of leaked passwords, which we're probably all familiar with. Uh, the good thing about have I been pwned is obviously, I mean, you might think to yourself, why would anybody publish a whole lot of passwords? But if they're already out there, it makes sense to have a, uh, a repository of these leaked passwords that if you are still using passwords in your uh, authentication systems, you can actually use their API to work out whether or not somebody's using likely reached password details and then force them to change their password to something more secure. It's quite a, a nifty tool as an aside. So let's have a look at SMS. Uh, this could also be email, any kind of mechanism where uh, a system could send you a message that will uh, allow you to prove that you received the email or the SMS. Maybe you've got a six-digit code or a, a custom URL. Uh, I know Slack do this. If you try to log into a new Slack team, rather than having to remember your username and password, you just provide your email address and it'll send you a link and you just click on that and you get logged in. Those kind of mechanisms are a lot more usable. In terms of how easy is it to remember? Well, they're really easy because there is nothing to remember except how to get access to your SMSs or to your, your email. Uh, so in terms of the usability of of SMS and uh, email and those types of, of credential mechanisms, it's it's easy to use, uh, easy to change as well. Not quite as easy as just changing a password in a, in a database field. But if I wanted to register a new mobile phone for my SMS authentication, that's something that's uh, technically quite easy to do and also fairly easy for a user from a user experience uh, to be able to do. Uh, same for uh, email addresses, changing your email in your, your profile. Uh, and then in terms of intercept, it's going to be slightly harder to intercept than an email. This now comes down. I've got SMS written there specifically, but it does depend on the medium. SMS, the S7 network, if you've ever heard of the, the um, I don't know if the, whether they were actually ever done in real life, but there was a whole lot of proof of concepts of the S7 network being um, used or, or um, attacked in order to be able to divert SMSs to uh, a recipient other than the intended recipient so that somebody could intercept that six digit code. So there are still intercept op opportunities uh, with SMS and email that we need to be aware of. And then you might see a pattern here. Let's have a look at something like biometrics, voice or fingerprints or things like that. Uh, in terms of ease of remembering, I don't know about you, but the last time I, re I remember leaving the house without my fingerprint, it was never. Uh, my voice, sometimes I leave at home if I've got a cold. Um, I don't really leave it at home. But also, I mean, th there's a whole lot of aspects that go into biometrics. If I've been uh, working in the garden, then maybe I've damaged my fingerprints in some way. So we have to be aware of these things. But by and large, in terms of how easy is it to remember and how hard, hard is it to uh, guess or to clone or to reproduce somebody's biometric information, it's it's on the hard scale. So I'm going to put that up, up at the top there. Um, I'm just going to make sure that I'm following any questions that come through. I'm happy to take questions as we go, by the way. Um, but I think we'll have a bit of time towards the end for questions as well. Um, so yes, biometrics, voice, uh, easy, easy-ish to use. Uh, however, they're very hard to change. Uh, the the fingerprint issue, um, even if each of your fingerprints was totally unique, which uh, I, I don't know about the statistics around it. I know that, that many of them are different, but there's only so many times you can change your fingerprint password in, in that case. Um, changing your voice uh, is something you could do if you're um, like a, a, a professional voice uh, voice artist, maybe. Uh, but you're now starting to look at uh, targeted attacks as well. So uh, not easy to change. And in terms of intercept, it's also going to be fairly hard to intercept. And like I say, even if you are trying to intercept a fingerprint, and there was a proof of concept a while ago of somebody who took a, um, a high resolution photo of a glass. I can't remember whether it was like the glass on a phone or a drinking glass or something, but they took a high resolution photo of a complete fingerprint and then imported that into a 3D modeling application and 3D printed a fingerprint that passed as the original. Now, obviously, in that situation, you need to have um, the it's a targeted attack on a particular fingerprint. You need to have the skills and knowledge to then turn that into a 3D model, and you need to have the tools to produce a, a 3D print in the material that will be accepted by the... Re so there's a whole lot of things that make it hard. Um, again, harder than SMS, harder than passwords. It's becoming harder. We're getting slightly more secure. Now, of course, we all know about multi-factor authentication, which is the uh, the implementation of at least two of any of these columns, something you know, something you have, or something you are. And by doing multiples, we can increase our security uh, footprint. Uh, and there's a whole lot of different kinds of, uh, of credential types that fit into this. So having spoken already about how passwords are what we no other worst. Like they're they're really hard to use unless you're using a password manager. And look, 
I, I know I, I use a password manager day in, day out, but I know my family members, they hate using a password manager because it's just, it, it's not intuitive for them. Uh, so we need to find ways of making it easier for our users to log in. So there's been a lot of talk recently as well about passwordless, which is essentially the inclusion of any credential type other than the something you know uh, column. So pin numbers, passwords, phrases, all of those kind of things, uh, they count as passwords. Everything else is passwordless. Uh, and then to improve the um, the, the login experience even further, uh, and one thing that I've mentioned uh, when it comes to any of these credentials, in, in fact, but particularly passwords, is the uh, the vulnerability that we face through phishing attacks. Um, so if we look at FIDO security keys on the right-hand side, FIDO security keys and uh, client certificates, are uh, they, they will protect us from phishing attacks. Uh, and the thing that I like about the FIDO security keys in particular, the client certificates, uh, if you're not aware, that's basically a certificate that's in your browser and gets communicated to the server. Uh, but usability-wise, it's tricky. You need to either roll those out um, through some kind of uh, local infrastructure based rollout of, of your um, your operating environment. Security keys are things that you hold in your hand, so they're much easier. Uh, but again, they both work on the public private key principle. Uh, they're really easy to remember. They're always in your hand. You notice if they're missing, uh, they're hard to guess because they're uh, uh, randomly cryptographically secure signatures. Uh, they're very easy to change insofar as they're similar to registering a new mobile phone. Uh, you would register a new uh, security key and in terms of intercept, uh, because of that public-private key uh, combination, and also, and we'll see in, in, in the next step, the anti-phishing uh, features that are built into WebAuthn, uh, it makes it highly secure and very hard to intercept. And like I mentioned, they're phishing resistant. So I want to take through, and the main part of, of today is to help you understand what the flow is, because understanding the flow will help you understand why it keeps you more secure. Uh, and also we'll touch a little bit on the actual implementation side, so you can see how easy it is to, to get started with WebAuthn. But I just want to quickly go through and remind what phishing is, so that we understand the, the core problem that we're trying to solve when we're trying to stop phishing attacks happening. So we take an average user who wants to log into a system. Let's say they, they want to log, log into Google. They get an SMS uh, or an email telling them they want to log into the Google because, I don't know, they've run out of disk space. Your, your account is maxed out. You need to upgrade or something like that. So they click on this link and they go to a page that looks like Google but isn't actually Google. So this is the, the core part of the phishing attack. Somebody sent a message which isn't actually Google sending the message, and they're trying to get you to go to a web page in order to provide your credentials. Convinced that this is what they're supposed to be doing, the user comes in, they pass their, their valid credentials in, and they get taken to a confirmation page or a success page of some sort, which is also fake. Uh, you could, at this point, redirect them to Google, and they probably logged in, and it would then means they could actually see their email, and that would be even more uh, uh, I've forgotten what the word is, but they were more believable. Um, but there's a, there's a good reason for putting a fake success page in. We'll come to that. So your valid credentials are now passed on to the, uh, the malicious user or probably more likely a bot or a script of some sort, which will then log into the, the Google server and get uh, the, the, the logged in state. So they now have access to your Google account. So what a lot of systems are doing nowadays is they'll put in this multi-factor authentication. They'll notice that somebody's logged in from a different location or maybe from a different browser or, or some kind of, something's out of the ordinary, or maybe they've never logged in from there before. There's no pre-existing session. So they'll, they'll do an escalation. They'll say, look, we, we're not convinced that we know that it's actually you. So we're going to send you an SMS or a, a push notification or some kind of verification mechanism to make sure you're actually the person wanting to log in. Now, the issue here is that Google is going to send the message to you, the person who's actually trying to log in, saying, it looks like somebody just tried to log in. Was it you? But in your mind, you did just try to log in. So unless you happen to notice that the IP address is different or it says you're from a different city than you actually are or, or any of those other notification uh, messages that you often see with them, if you don't notice those, you might actually go through and say yes, and now the person's logged in anyway. So the, most of the multi-factor authentication, it'll keep you more secure in terms of protecting your credentials, but it doesn't address phishing. So essentially, phishing comes down to the ability to create a fake, fake login page. Let's go in now to the, um, the WebAuth flow, and we'll see how the registration and the login processes work and how it solves this uh, phishing uh, issue that we have. 
So let's say this is me and I want to log into your website. So I go to my browser, I type in your URL and I click on the register account page. So a, a request gets sent to your server saying, hey, I want to create an account and I want to create the account with the username Ben. Your server says, that's great. We don't have a username Ben yet. We're going to have to create an account for you though. So it then responds with a challenge. And this is basically some cryptographically generated random string of some sort that gets sent to the browser with the instruction to say, look, I need you to work with me and we'll create some kind of credential that in the future we can use to authenticate you again. So the browser will then use this new navigator.credentials API, which is in the latest browsers. Uh, and this is basically the web Orphan API. And it'll call the create method. And into it, it's going to pass the challenge that was sent from the server. It's also going to send the web origin from the browser, from the, the page that it's currently looking at. And this is where the phishing attacks get, get stopped in their tracks. Because if I'm at google.com, then the web origin that goes in is going to be google.com. But if I get sent to some fake g00g1e.com domain, then the web origin that goes through is going to be that fake domain, which means that when my uh, my key, which we'll see in the next step, creates a public private key pair, it's going to create it for a different web origin. So we're, we're tying this key pair down to this web origin, which means that in the future, we can only use it for logging into the same web origin. So let's continue. The uh, the hardware authenticator, which could be, I mean, they're, they're tiny things. I don't know whether you can quite make it out, but this is a tiny USB-C one that plugs into the side of your computer. You get some that communicate via Bluetooth or um, NFC. You can get them built in. If you've got one of the MacBook Pros with your fingerprint scanner on it, uh, they've got a hardware authenticator built in that will support Web WebAuthn. Uh, and what they do when they get this request to create an account is they will generate a public-private key pair and then they will use the private key to sign the challenge that was sent originally from the website that's trying to create an account for you. So then it stores the private key on the, the hardware authentication device, and it will return the public key and the signature back to the browser. So the browser then receives these and essentially just passes them straight through to your server. Your server now receives the public key and the signed uh, challenge. So now at this point, we finished the, the, the registration process, which basically has had me make a request for a, a new user called Ben. I've received a challenge, and then I've re returned to your, your server a signed challenge and the public key. Your server can then say, well, okay, here's the challenge I sent. Here's the signature I got, and here's the public key. And this signature matches this public key for that challenge. With these three all matching up, your server can now manifest a local user and store that uh, public key with the user for the next time when I want to log in. Let's have a look at how the, how the login works. So instead of sending just the challenge back, uh, when I log in, I'm going to say, hey, I want to log in as Ben. And your server says, hey, we've got a Ben and we've got a public key. And this public key has this ID. And this ID will uh, basically allow the hardware authenticator to know which private key to use. So we're going to send you uh, or you're going to send my browser, browser not just the challenge that needs to be signed, but also the identifier of the key that was used for the registration process. So my browser then takes those and passes those uh, in much the same way as it did for, for get. Uh, it uses uh, for create. It uses the get method, but in addition to passing through the challenge and the web origin here, it'll also pass through this ID. So now the hardware authenticator can pull out the private key that's associated with that ID. And it can then take that to sign the new challenge that it's received, which is obviously going to be different from the first challenge. It'll be a different challenge every single time. It takes that, uh, that signed challenge and returns that back to the browser, and the browser will then pass that back to your server. So your server can now say, hey, I've just had somebody try to log in as Ben. I've got Ben's private key, uh, public key rather already. I sent this challenge, and the signature that came back matches the public key, therefore, Ben is allowed to log in. So in a nutshell, that's the, the registration flow uh, and, and the login flow, which shows to you how uh, you can use these uh, Navigator credential API uh, within the latest browsers to talk to a hardware authentication device. Uh, it eliminates phishing attacks and allows people to create and log into accounts without having to have a password. Uh, there is um, 
time for a demo after this. I'll be doing one at the booth, at the Old Zero booth. So I'd love you to come and join me for that. And there, I, I would like to also show you uh, some user nameless authentication, which is a really exciting development in web authentication, whereby I don't even need to provide my username in the first instance. You can have people create an account just by uh, touching the fingerprint on their, their laptop or holding an NFC card close to their phone. So that's a really exciting uh, development on top of that. Um, but for now, uh, I realize we uh, ran over slightly in the previous session, so I'd like to give you some time back. Um, but I will take some some questions if there is time. We have about two minutes, I think. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, the, my contact details are up on the screen, and I'd love to see you over at the Auth0 booth. Uh, one final thing I'd like to add, though, if I can, John, just before you <laughs> say something, we're, we're also having a giveaway at the booth. So if you want to go in to win, uh, potentially win a set of noise cancelling headphones, come to the booth and I can tell you all about that. Thanks, Ben. So when when will you be at the booth? Uh, as soon as I'm finished here, I'll jump straight Okay, over. so you're going straight from here to your booth. All right. Yes. So people should I'll know stick around until you kick me off. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. I, I think we all learned a little bit more about authentication and uh, and the different different methods that uh, that can be applied. Um, I think uh, Dan is running a workshop tomorrow also. Uh, he actually ran a workshop earlier today already. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He ran a workshop yeah. earlier today. Um, oh, and so we've got um, yeah. So people can find you at your booth and yes. uh, get a bit more detail of that. And also, if you can't make it to the booth today, if there's talks that you want to go to that you're interested in, we'll be at the booth today and tomorrow. But also, I'm Ben Decker. I'm on pretty much all the social media channels. So contact me however you like. I look forward to hearing from anybody. Okay. Thanks very much, Ben. Great. Thanks. Um,